Loud and Quiet presents Midnight Chats. Hey listeners, welcome to Midnight Chats. Hope you're doing well. Tonight's episode of the podcast features not one, but two firsts for us. We've never had two different artists on together on the same episode before, so that's exciting. And also, until now, we've never welcomed on an artist more than once, so that's all about to change. Those with either a good memory or maybe you're just very loyal uh, will know that David Kumu was our guest on the very first Midnight Chats back in February 2016. Um, we sounded quite different then. I'm not going to bleat on about how impressive Dave's career CV is because that's all in the first episode. But his story and that chat, especially his recollections of his close brush with death a few years back, remains a pretty extraordinary listen, um, I think, at least. I'm delighted to say joining us for the first time is Rosie Lowe. From Devon, but now based in London, Rosie released her debut album Control in 2016. And in the run-up to recording this chat, I went back and listened to that and was reminded of just how strong that album is. In the time since then, she's continued to study psychotherapy alongside doing her music. She talks a bit about that in this, and it's really fascinating. And she also presents a show on the all-female online radio station Foundation FM. Check that out if you haven't already. But the point of getting them together like this is that Rosie and Dave aren't just great mates, but also wrote Rosie's new album, You, together. Spelt Y-U, it's out on the 10th of May. And Birdsong, one of the tracks from it, is an early favourite of mine from this year. Um, So yeah, lots of conversation about that. The origins of their friendship, getting the mercurious J Electronica involved on the album, Dave's relatively new fatherhood, um, Rosie discussing vulnerability and openness in the creative process, all sorts. Before we get into this, we try and make all of the episodes sound as good as they possibly can on Midnight Chats. So I am annoyed that at one point a workman turned up outside our office window with a giant saw to cut sheets of metal. Um, But I wasn't going to argue with him for obvious reasons. So apologies for any brief background noise you might hear. As ever, if you haven't caught the episodes from this series of the podcast so far, please do go back and listen. Sharon Van Etten last week was really funny. Um, But let's get into this. Midnight Chats, episode 70, ticking off not one, but two firsts, Rosie Lowe and Dave Akumu. You did the first ever episode of Midnight Chats. I can't believe it. Are you running out of guests? Is that, is that, are you running out of Busted. people in the, in the universe of music? <laughs> not at all. Not at all. You were so good that we just had to have you back. Um, it, was, it was three years ago, almost to the day. In fact, we're sat here in our, in our humble office in, in East London, loud and quiet, HQ. And you came in on a miserable winter's night to record the first episode and I will always be grateful because (laughs) the podcast obviously didn't exist before you came in so I couldn't send you anything and say this is what it sounds like and you took a leap of faith and you came in and that was the first episode it was really scary for me Um, (laughs) I I didn't know what I was getting into I was actually telling Rosie about it today I was trying to I thought we actually recorded it around midnight we did record it late at night okay and that wasn't because I got the time wrong because (laughs) <laughs> it's not because you, you, uh, you when think... you said come in at 11 I was just late, really late because he's I'm not often quite late, so. <laughs> and eventually I'm just there just eating my dinner really sadly yeah, exactly. I'm like Dave still hasn't turned up he's like, I think he might have got the wrong end of the stick yeah. no we did we did record it late it was I late night it was vibes late, and it was a miserable night and I was really happy to be here yeah yeah, yeah. well great. we've we've gone on to make um, make, make a lot of episodes since then but If people are listening to this who are only joining us more recently, I do urge you to go back and listen to that episode because it's 
it will have a special place for me because not only because it was the first one but I do think it was a really great episode for to have you on and, and to hear about kind of all of the things that you've done in your in your musical career to date but it is special to have you both on because you're both good friends as well as being collaborators and it's a timely moment to have you on together because you've both just worked together on Rosie your new album can you remember where you first met where you first got introduced was that a long time ago well we both kind of have a <laughs> we both have kind of differing um <clears throat> views from we or memories of when we first met so i think like we we did kind of cross paths quite a lot uh, quite a few times but my first real memory is uh in hanging out in dave's flat mm-hmm. i was i went around and David just had an accident, so he'd broken a, had like a leg in a cast. Yep. And I went round and we just hung out and played some music and ate some strawberries and some donuts and <laughs> I did some washing up. <laughs> <laughs> not, not much has changed. Yeah, no, that, that was a really special moment. We'd, we'd met a few times before. I remember, because you told me that um, I'd, I'd sometimes go into Goldsmiths to talk about and ask questions about performance and creativity and they keep sort of wheeling me back in and it's always really fun to go in and and hang out with those guys and I think one year I did it and Rosie was in one of those um, sessions but we didn't meet at that time. My first memory of Rosie coming into sort of my consciousness was um, I was having a meeting at, at Domino. Rosie's manager at the time came in to play me some of her music and I think maybe you just sort of really started making your own music at that point in that um, way in that, yeah. in that way yeah and, and um, I heard these these pieces of music and I thought they were really special and extraordinary and I, Rosie's manager was asking if I'd be up for kind of getting together with her and collaborating with her and I remember specifically thinking at that point that this was someone who didn't really need to collaborate with anybody. They were just exploring their own creativity and their own voice. And and it was a really strong and intriguing one. And actually, I remember my first instinct being, um, I wouldn't want to get in the way of that. Actually, this is someone who should just be like encouraged to continue exploring themselves because it's really fascinating. And that's, that's going to lead to something really special. Mm. And then we kind of met some time after that and... At, at a certain point, Rosie came round to basically look after me when I was convalescing, and I remember that that was a really significant visit, just because it it sh- I feel like it sort of correlated to the experience of listening to her music in the sense of getting a really strong sense of who this person is. Mm. I remember feeling that listening to to those demos, those early demos. And when she came to my house at a time when I was, I was feeling pretty vulnerable mm. um, and I didn't really know her that well, but I felt so at ease and so looked after and we just had such a lovely time and she was so considerate and kind of loving and um, natural. I just thought, what a great person, <laughs> you know, really lucky to, to have sort of crossed paths with this person. And um, I don't think at that point we knew you know what our creative connection would be but I just remember thinking oh, I'd love this person to be a part of my life basically so that was a really special day so thanks for doing the washing up <laughs> <laughs> it's my way of saying thanks and then creatively <laughs> after that I think that um, I mean I'd written Right Thing and I'd actually pitched it pitched the whole thing down that's how I wrote it was so my voice was my male voice, as it were. And this is kind of like, you know, I, I mean, I can't, I can't believe it was so long ago, but it was probably at seven, eight years ago now. What? Ah! <laughs> um, so there wasn't loads of people pitching everything down. The label or, or Domino at the time were just like, mm, sure. And I played to Dave uh, and, and saying, like, this is what I imagined. And he was really digging it. And then he, he I think he took that one off before we started working with Quez and you did some stuff to it because I just remember getting something Dave sending something back and me feeling like damn this is this is phenomenal like is I've always felt like that with Dave is like that every single decision he makes is a creative one he doesn't overdo it which in my experience with other people that I've worked with can often be that that people do things for the sake of doing them Mm. but I feel like with Dave 
you get an incredible amount of in intricacies. Whoa, big word. Um, but always for the reason for the song and for the narrative and for for the heart of what's what the song's about. And I've never really had that experience with anyone else yet no. of passing something over and it coming back and feeling like that's beyond what I imagine this could be. It's interesting you say that because both of you have collaborated with a lot of people in the past. You know, you, you're very open-minded to when you're making music to bring other people into the process. How easy is it to find people who you feel so comfortable with that are so ultimately on a similar wavelength? It's just really special when that happens and, um, and probably quite rare. But I do think that it's possible to have a disposition that makes it kind of clear that that's what you're looking for and that's what you're interested in mm. and that you want to cultivate relationships of that like qu quality. So um, for me, collaboration is like a big part of my life and um, I'm looking for high quality collaborative experiences mm. and some are and some aren't but I think that exploration is valid and I think what you said about you know it's I think I think having the tools and the desire to cultivate trust and to be patient and to 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 make space for something like that to happen is like a big part of that equation and when you find someone who's willing to go on that journey with you that's something to be treasured basically and and with Rosie, we have that in a, in a really, really unique way. There are ways of exploring things creatively that um, in, in my collaboration with Rosie that I don't feel I could just, I could do with anyone else. And it's because of who she is and what she's interested in and how she wants to express herself and where she feels, you know, able to be liberated and take risks and be vulnerable. And I, I really, really respond to that. And it's, it feels like an enormous privilege to be allowed into that and to be allowed to sort of attempt to facilitate that or um, contribute to that or however you want to kind of frame it. So yeah, I guess I guess I, I feel like it's it's a very special thing that I will never take for granted wherever I find it. But I'm always looking for it. I'm always looking for for a quality connection, basically. But if I find it, I'm gonna gonna hang on to it for dear life because it's a it's a really precious thing basically yeah. yeah yeah and also and like on top of that i'd say that me and mine and dave's relationship has grown through the music that we've made like our collaborative relationship so for the first album i wrote most of it on my own and dave produced it so we have it was so collaborative but this album we actually wrote together for the first time yeah. like song songwriting together which I was, I was shit scared about, because I was like this, you know, he's one of my best friends, you know, one of my musical heroes. He's like my collaborator, and I was like, this, this better work out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Otherwise we could be in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it, it did, and I, I think that we had to find our way of doing that, and sometimes it was giving each other space and sometimes it was being in a room together mm. and sometimes it was like creating more structure and sometimes it wasn't mm. but that's something that we were able to work out because there was already an understanding there of what we've been through before so had we gone into just writing together in the way that we have for this latest album mm. without the kind of seven years of of growing our relationship as friends and collaborators. It might sound completely different, yeah, yeah. but what I feel like so, so grateful for and very, very lucky is the fact that we've, or I, you know, we're growing together mm -hmm. as collaborators and that that journey's continuing. Cause I feel like these days there's so, so many artists that, and, and you know, um, I think it's encouraged by labels and stuff a lot of the time, which is like, you know, new album, new producer, this is the next hot person, right. go in with them, speed date the album, um, speed date writing sessions, you know, new sound, new album, new sound, and that therefore it means new people. And I just feel like there can be a lack of long-term collaborative relationships where you grow together. And I feel really lucky to have had that with Dave and hopefully continue it for my career. What you're describing is kind of the antithesis of that you just said there that the speed date way of making music. We had Koji Radical was one of the episodes on this series of Midnight Chats and he was talking about his 
collaborative past and some of the positions he's found himself in where it is that thing where you're you join a writing camp for a morning or an afternoon and you're given a theme and you're like it's like go away and make a song for somebody you've never met mm. in and report back in two hours which is the, of the spectrum we've just been talking about is the opposite end of what you're describing which is like create a sort of deep meaningful friendship to to create trust and then you know open up the process where you've got to know each other and it's it's, it's, it's the opposite end of the spectrum of that isn't it basically does that type of songwriting what, what do you think of that is that that's kind of like does the idea of doing that kind of thing you know would you rule out ever doing that thing because this the way that you do it feels much more in keeping with the way you, you want to do things I think there's an there's an aspect where you have to come to terms with who you are and recognise yourself, recognise where your strengths lie, recognise where you want to progress as a person, basically creatively. And my what I know about myself through kind of various experiences is that I lean towards the type of process that, that we've described. Mm. And I'm interested in that. I'm interested in the long term and the big picture and on going on a journey and making Rosie's first album I had dreams of making more albums with her I have dreams of her developing and just making her own albums and producing her own records and I can't wait to hear that and there are all these things that I see that it's over like a, a long period and that excites me I'm just that's just my nature and I think there are issues for me around the the, the sort of speedier process that you describe I mean I know that a lot of the industry is built on that really and there's clearly like a place for it but my my issue with it is that I think if that kind of obfuscates any other type of process, you know, if there isn't room for other processes, mm. that's not so great because people are unique and there isn't like a sort of one size fits all mold. And I think when we stop engaging with artists and creative people and working out like what they actually need to be the best version of themselves and mm. to express themselves really well and to work out what their identity is, if we're not supporting that and there's just this industry around it, that basically kind of overrides that. I think that's really problematic, and sometimes the the speedier thing can can really um, sort of exacerbate that that kind of way of thinking. Mm. But I will also say that I've had many moments in in my own sort of creative process where I've just written for people, like imagining, oh my god, what would it be like if like Beyonce like sang this tune, or <laughs> you know, or like when I got invited into like Grace Jones's world in the first instance Iva her producer said to me you know if you want to like submit some 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 ideas for this album then you know go ahead and I immediately went ran a bath and sat in a bath and then sang into like my my phone imagining whoa what if Grace Jones like sang this melody do you know what I mean it's like so I'm really into that. I think that's a wonderful thing, but it just can't be like the only thing. That's when it becomes a problem for me. Mm. And I've personally found it that I don't necessarily operate at, at my peak powers when I'm in those types of situations where it's, it's about, it's product orientated, you know, it's about getting a result at the end of the day over exploring something that might might just need a bit more space to like come to the surface you know that's yeah that's kind of where I stand personally but some people have incredibly honed skills and they're able to go into situations yeah. like that and make extraordinary things and like power to them but I think my strengths kind of lie elsewhere and my interests as well like I think it is about knowing where your strengths lie like I know that as a collaborator with Dave like with my music Dave always like kind of is at his best when I give him space trust faith space mm. and I think vice versa is the is the same in, in our relationship I personally like I don't really respond very well to pressure do I Dave <laughs> in some writing um, and I kind of I kind of freeze up okay. like I need a little bit of pressure because otherwise you know it could just you know I could probably you know get into to watch too many series and stay in bed all day no I'm joking but but like that kind of pressure of being in a room of lots of producers jump in the booth that's one way to make me run really really fast marathon right. uh, away from that <laughs> situation personally i i've been in those situations before and it's like let's write a song about this mm. and my response is but why mm. 
and what does that mean and what's the bigger meaning behind this and why <laughs> and why again yeah and why because like, music for me is such a deep thing so the idea of songwriting as a craft is something that I'm so passionate about like mm. so passionate about I could talk about for five hours about different people songwriting but the only songwriting that really I'm passionate about is the shit that I believe in mm-hmm. and I know in like five seconds if I believe it or not mm. and that's usually because it's come from a place of honesty yeah yeah and the idea of like okay let's write a song about this word because it's a good sounding word although like you it some people can like completely bring an honesty and an authenticity to that for me like it needs to come from somewhere that already exists yeah, yeah. at the moment maybe that will change in time but yeah let's talk about this new album you you wrote it together so what was the start point for it you decided you were going to collaborate in, in, in the writing sense. What was day one? What did it look like? Did you sit well, down together at the kitchen table? Did you have a list of ideas? Bit, yeah. what, what, what was it like? What do you see as the starting point? I'd be uh, to know. The way, the way in probably. your spare room, yeah, upstairs in, spare room. in your flat. Yeah. And the, it was a really hot summer day. <laughs> and so all the doors were open. And like it was really loud because if anyone's been to Deptford, you know the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> and there was drilling going on at the time, Some wasn't there? Roadworks. Serious construction, yeah. It was a Dave, crazy summer. Dave lives by the train station, so that was you could hear the trains going by, and he was playing just lots of chords, and I was like, oh, like that one. And we recorded it all on my iPhone or something. Yeah. And I had a few ideas, I think, and then I went home, and I kind of cut them up at the end of the day, and and I came back with the chorus for the way. And a few other ideas, and you were like, no, I like that, that, that's our starting point for this. Mm. And then we just went around that for like, kind of the whole, for like a few hours, and then we had the verses and everything. Yeah. Did you settle on like a pattern of working, as in, you had a, a set of time, you were like, we're going to work on, on this <sighs> nine to five, or we're going to... Yeah, no, yeah, or that's did what it... we did, yeah. It was oh, really, right, right, right. really organised. Did that yeah. for, for two and a half years. <laughs> <laughs> Presumably, it was just gra- grabbing the time when you could then, and it or it, it was. How did it take? It was, how did it come to eventually be? Well, basically, I, I just remember us kind of making the commitment to one another that we mm-hmm. were going to do it mm-hmm. one way or another. And, and again, that's a really empowering thing for me. Like when you when you find that with a person where you can just make a commitment. The world is a crazy place. You never know what's going to happen, how people are going to respond, or what teams are going to be doing or what labels are going to be doing and it just felt great to just say to each other let's make a record you know like come come rain or shine it was a crazy time for me I had a lot of things going on I was moving out of one studio trying to build another I didn't really have a base of operations so had a baby um, yeah in that time also had a baby and didn't have a midlife crisis or maybe that was my manifestation of midlife crisis I don't know but, um, <laughs> but uh, it, you know it was, it was a really huge time of like transition for me and it's a it's a real testament to Rosie that she kind of walked through that with me and that's really special for me as well because it's that's in this record in a way so she, I remember we were working in all kinds of places sometimes we'd be at the church at Paul Atwood Studio sometimes we were at my flat sometimes we were at Rosie's flat Sometimes I was in a cafe on headphones. Like we were making it up as we go along in terms of the structure and just trying to create the space and the quality of process that that we needed to make that music. And because our our the nature of our collaboration was kind of going deeper in a sense, um, I felt like I just yeah really wanted to give. Rosie, whatever she needed and whatever I could for her to kind of work out what she wanted to say next and how she wanted to say it. And it's, I think when you're close to a person, you kind of, you have these sort of instincts. I remember feeling quite early on, like really probably even that day when we were sort of starting to look at chords for, or ideas for that song, The Way. I remember just feeling, I think there's, I think we're going to go to like a brighter place and I think it's going to be like earthier or something. I just had these kind of, yeah. and maybe there's going to be more of like a live feeling. I just had these kind of instincts that these might be things that Ro would want to explore like in the next bit, the next phase of her output. And um, 
yeah so it just became about working out how to how to find that palette how to um inspire what whatever needed to come next basically so yeah it was it wasn't without its challenges i think it would have been easier if i'd been say more settled if i'd had my space ready and whatever and then we could have got on with things in a more structured way i think it but would have been a different record this would have been a different record point. and actually the way things went and the time that it took allowed a space for something to happen that obviously just needed to happen and, and again coming back to your earlier question about kind of the writing camp approach versus some another type of approach the thing that freaks me out about that is like what well, you know I see good things happening all the time because they've been given space and they've been nurtured so if you don't give things space, if, if you're working in an industry where space is at such a premium that it almost can't, it just can't exist because everything needs to be like bang and product driven and it's got to sound finished like by the end of the day and a label needs to hear this and, and you know, there's so much competition that every artist has to put out a thousand tracks a day and two million um, social media posts just to kind of exist I think I think the danger is that you there's no space for these really special things to actually come to the surface and because some things require a lot of space you know and it can take a while to like to sort of dial down the noise and and reconnect with yourself and go actually who am I and what is my identity and what is unique about how I express myself versus all this other stuff in the world and I really felt that that's what happened over that period of like a couple of years of us kind of like foraging around in the undergrowth trying to work out how to make a record, you know, in, in, in you know, the next chapter of our, our collaboration. And, and yeah, when I listen to it now, that's what I hear in it. So I'm, I'm really proud of that as well. It just feels like it's a real reflection of like going somewhere we actually went somewhere and we dug in and it's a different feeling to what we did the first time round. and there's a progression before i ask you a little bit about stuff outside of you tell me a little bit about the people that you also brought on board because you co-wrote the record but then there are other people on the album jamie wounds on there um jamie liddell's on there uh, J electronica's on there yeah. i thought J electronica being a J electronica fan yeah. i was I've recently come to think that I don't think he exists. He's the he's the man in the myth, isn't he? He's Banksy. He is. He's like the Banksy of hip hop. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, tell me a little bit about those people that you brought on board, and where did you find Jay Electronica? Well, with that, was he one, that was actually for the way the way that we the one that we started in Dave's flat, and it's a love song. Like it's a it's a positive love song, which you know I just don't fucking do that. <laughs> But I do now. <laughs> I've always, I always resist that kind of just. I just feel like I'm, I'm, I'm got this innate feeling of resistance to anything that's like just in, inherently positive because I feel like it's cheesy. Right, but I've right. actually come to the accept that cheesy is fucking brilliant. Yeah, and it's just authentic because that's yes. the way you felt when you Absolutely. wrote it. Absolutely, and I'm in a place of, and very in love, and you know the whole album's kind of about about the kind of complexities of love. And relationships, and anyway, so on that on that song, me and Dave were like, we've got to get a rapper on this. You know, Dave is always encouraging me, like, who's the dream? Think big, don't restrict your vision. So I was like, well, obviously Andre Three Thousand, J Electronica, Tyler the Creator, and Kendrick. And so I went into a label meeting, and I was like, these are the people that I want. I was like, you know, maybe maybe J Electronica. They were like, oh, he's going to be, he doesn't do stuff. He's going to be too expensive. You know, he might not. And I was like well that's a lot of speculation can we try and there was quite I was met with quite a lot of resistance and then they did finally send it to, I was like let's just try you might like the track and then we got an email back saying he loves it he's going to do a verse and then a few months later I was thinking well you know take things with a big pinch of salt that might not happen it might happen it I got I land one day I woke up and it was in my inbox a direct from him and Sick. literally, Sick. I was like, I played that. <laughs> and I don't think I've jumped that high for a long time. <laughs> it, that it was, it's absolutely incredible. And just phenomenal how much of mm. he's picked up in his verse mm. from the whole album. He mentions songs in the, on the album that he doesn't even know that existed. So like, 
it's like something really spiritual happened mm. with that verse because yeah, honestly it's crazy. It really fit, I've yeah. read those lyrics so many times and thought so- someone's tricked me what, as if he'd been like somehow like watching the process and had had like an innate understanding of what had been going yeah, on yeah. Been given all my album lyrics and had some like overarching meaning of what exactly what I'd been through in this one verse it's absolutely <laughs> kind of I still can't believe it actually you know, we ended up with these two versions of the song and um, I wanted to see if there was a way to blend them together so that it went into like the slower version at a certain point in the tune. And when I was kind of cobbling it together as an experiment, I was like, oh, it'd be amazing. I just thought I heard, I heard Jay's voice basically in that mix and I, I thought it would be interesting to have that type of element come into a track where you didn't expect it to be there basically Mm. and I just thought he would be perfect like the tone of his voice the character of how he expresses himself it was just like my my first choice and we had this discussion about basically about our favorite rappers Mm. we've always collected over Jay though haven't we yeah we we always have and 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 similarly like when it became a reality and I heard what he'd done there was it was such an affirmation of so many things because as Rosie says, it, it reflects so much of the kind of um, intention of the, re- of the record as a whole. You know, so often with those sorts of contributions, when someone like that does agree to like jump on a track, it's like about getting paid and maybe there's not that much thought goes into like what's being expressed and it's just like everyone thinks it's cool but it's actually not that deep so but to hear I can hear he's enjoying himself on that track and he's enjoying his imagination and he's responding to like what's there and he's he's going deep which is kind of like what the whole record's about and it was really a great moment to hear that you know those few that just that moment being so such an engaged explosion of creativity yeah, basically yeah. it's just like yeah it's the stuff of dreams really so that, that's yeah really it has a really special place in my heart it's just it's really cool outside of the making of the record people that have listened to the first episode that we did of midnight chats will remember you and i dave talking about some major kind of life altering events we went deep on yeah, we life and and yeah. and, and, and deep therapy. deep meaning yeah yeah <laughs> outside of creating this album together the last couple of years mm. dave you already mentioned it like the significant things that's happened to both of you dave you become a, a father yeah. since then three years yeah. is it, how old is your he's, son? Go, he's going to be two at the end of april okay yeah so that is subsequent how's fatherhood basically the best thing that's ever happened to me it's okay. uh man I don't know I don't want to I could very easily end up in sounding like I don't know sort of going into sort of some sort of smug self-indulgent like <laughs> parent mode or you know the equivalent of like bombarding your listeners with images of my child or something <laughs> But um, I. But he is. But He's getting I'm his iPhone out right now, He's showing his photos. Guys, can you see this? Can you see this? Can you see how cute he is? Um, he is amazing. All I can dis- all I can say is that um, I don't know. It's it's strange the culture around sort of parenthood and people's kind of anxieties around it and whatever people might think that stuff means. And obviously, lots of people have kids, don't they? And we were all babies once. I will just say, for me, the experience has been the equivalent of um, falling in love like over and 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 over again. It's like every single day, it's like falling in love. And I guess in this in this um, early sort of stage of, of of my cub's life, he's changing so much all the time. So maybe that's part of it. That's why it's so heightened, that sense of like, oh my God, (laughs) you know, you just had a nap and then you suddenly you've got an afro or like, like, you know, now you're doing this incredibly cute thing or whatever. Part of me thinks it's kind of a function of evolution, you know, so that we protect them and nurture them. We have to be in love with them. Man, that shit works. Basically, I'm, yeah, he's the apple of my eye. He's just the best thing ever. And he, something that, that I really love about being a parent, you know, it's not without its challenges and it stretches you and does all kinds of things. But the thing that I really love is that it compels you to be in the moment. You know, babies, nothing will do that better than a baby. It's like 
they demand your your engagement and your presence and the point at which it becomes miserable is if you don't respond to that mm. but if you respond to that you are going to go on the wildest trip like they will show you how to be in the moment and that's really I, you know that's really what I want to build my life around anyway so if I've got this like living breathing entity that just helps me do that every day I'm like um, yeah it's it's so cool it's so cool and he's just such a dude and He's um, so much fun. <laughs> he's, really, he's really fun. Was he like running in and out when you were like working at any point? It's kind of no. He's well, no, because he wasn't really at that point. So yeah, he's he's still so young. He will be for the next album. Yeah, the yeah, next yeah, album, yeah, I'm yeah. sure he's probably going to end up like playing drums in the next. He's so yeah. He's <laughs> he's, 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 he's pretty, definitely going to be a percussionist. He's pretty isn't funky. He? Yeah. <laughs> he's got the pots and pans out yeah, already. Yeah, he's on yeah. he's on the pots and pans. His or on my thing. washing machine. Ding, yeah, ding, yeah. Ding, 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 ding. He might have an interest in electronic music. That's yeah. yeah, I think I don't know. We'll see. I'm curious to see where he where he goes. But yes, it's, it's been really, really wonderful. He's amazing and I can't there's this weird thing that happens when they they kind of um, you know, descend to earth or however it is that they appear, where you're just once they're there, you're like, What? You weren't here? Like what mm. my life just the idea of my life before just seems like some sort of empty husk. It's just so much richer now. And, yeah, it's brilliant. And Rosie, that outside of the making of the the album the last few years, am I right in thinking you went and studied? Are you kind of like yeah, doing some qualifications? Um, well, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I am studying to be a psychotherapist. So it's been like quite a huge journey of self-development. Uh, it's definitely been something that's influenced my music and every part of me actually in my process as well. And I'm sure it will continue. So I've done the first three years and I've got four more years to go. And yeah. It's been amazing. It's the other thing, other than music, really, that I all I want to do is that, like, mm. read um, about relationship therapy and psychosexual. That's, like, what I want to go down, um, go into. But I just read, like, a thousand books on the mind and emotions. I just find it so interesting and listen to podcasts and it kind of every other second I have. So, like, my dream is to be making music and th those two things combined I think I'd be a very happy girl you mentioned it's affected the or, or changed perhaps the way that you approach your own creative process mm. in what ways like how, how's that kind of can you think of examples of the way that's happened or changed even the, in, in the last say for example approaching the writing on the on your first album as opposed mm. to writing on this one given that you've been studying the whole way through mm. how is that are those changes major? Are they minor? What, or are they difficult to articulate? Or, I well, I think it's changed my... Even what the subject of the record completely. Because my the record's about love and the complexities of love and my relationship with my partner. We've been going to relationship therapy for the last five years. Mm -hmm. So that's had such a big influence on it anyway. But basically, just self-awareness so I've got I know that I've got abilities um, particularly when I'm like recording my relationship with my voice mm -hmm. I'd say like it's really opened that up in terms of like resisting messiness and which can sometimes come with an openness as well you know we all know that like to be to kind of be free it's sometimes messy and it's sometimes chaotic mm -hmm. and I think that there's been like an ongoing resistance of that in relation to my voice at times, in, the re in relation to how I record myself, how I want to hear myself sing. So at one point in the album process, I, it kind of all came apart at the seams for me. And I was like, what is this? Who am I? Where am I in these songs? I'm, I think I'm, I think, I think I'm going to quit or die or something. I don't know what's mm. going on, but this is, it all came apart at the seams and that's because I was processing something really deep. And basically, thanks to my therapists and the fact that I was studying, so I had like a huge support network and my boyfriend and Dave was, it was all about reminding me, you know, Dave sat down with me and was like, okay, tell me what all these songs are that we've written are about. Mm. And I was like, I don't know. He was like, okay, let's go through them what's this song about? And I was like, well, this song is about my relationship with Jacob in this way or my relationship with this person. 
And as soon as I said it, I was like, oh, like it's entirely, it's entirely accurate and present and I'm in, wholly in it. But I forgot because I was going through a process of kind of, of like self-analysis. And so basically, I guess what I'm saying is like, it all feeds into each other. And as soon as I'd gone through that process, it was kind of about owning it again, re-owning the songs for where I was at at the point and being like, I guess it allowed me to be like, to, to create space, to have more of a freedom to be able to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So that was a really long winded way. Basically, I think I'm a perfectionist mm -hmm. in like a deep, deep way. And I think that that's down, if I'm going to go into self analysis, I think that's down to like having a lack of security sometimes and feeling like I need to control things to create that security through my process of becoming a therapist, you have to do just a lot of self-development. I think that I've, I'm, I'm still working through that stuff, but I think that it's allowed me some space to be able to make mistakes and for that to be okay. Yeah. And some more self-compassion mm -hmm. within that. And vocally it's freeing me up in a, a huge way that I've never really experienced before. And I'm actually really enjoying singing again. Can I also get a word on your work with Foundation FM? Yes. So you've done a handful of shows? Yeah. 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 So for people that have not come across Foundation FM, of our listeners that haven't heard about it, just tell them a little bit, bit about it and also why you wanted to get involved. Well, it's an all-female platform radio station set up by some incredible women that have been in radio and have, you know, been surrounded by kind of male voices in radio and thought felt like there's... There's, there needs to be more of a space for or a platform for women where it was just totally supporting each other, having a voice for different women from different backgrounds, um, particularly in London, where it's like such a kind of, you know, stirring pot for that. Mm. So they asked me if I wanted to do a show and like, absolutely, that's like, every, just to be involved in a platform where it's like female focused, but in the most supportive way, excites me. Like, I want to meet more incredible women and support them and feel supported and create kind of... We've just got, like, amazing people around us and the more people that we can meet in terms of, like, that have kind of, you know, exciting and different perspectives on things, the better, I think. So, yeah, I've got a monthly show on there and I bring on guests and my show is kind of focused on... I'm interested on um, processes that musicians go through that people might not hear about. And that might come from writing process, that might come from the day job that so many musicians have, but don't talk about, just mm -hmm. to be able to make the rent, yeah, their course. rent, or to put bread on the table. So that's kind of what I'm interested in, going a little bit deeper than, than what can often feel like happens on radio. But although now there's podcasts, everyone's going deep, it's great. Yeah. I just wanted to say though, just what you were saying before about your kind of, growing understanding of yourself and how that's impacted your creativity and perfectionism. I just think it's such an important area to have like a dialogue around because I think a lot of people suffer from, from this and struggle with, with this stuff, especially in this day and age where technology kind of gives us a certain illusion of control, like over processes, of, you know, just thinking about what happened when we came in here, I'm like, worry because my phone's running out of battery or he's like backing stuff up it's like this whole thing it's like technology which is meant to kind of free us up seems to be feeding into these really um uh sort of actually restrictive tendencies and what was interesting at that that point that Ro was very bravely describing where things kind of fell apart at the seams which was a really necessary part of the process because without that happening we wouldn't have got through to the other side um, and I'm really glad she kind of had the support that she needed through that. But what was interesting to me was that actually, you know, there's a striving for, for perfection or betterment and actually it can end up restricting us and throttling our expression. What's interesting to me is actually what happens when we start to, to let go of the idea of perfection, basically, and how quickly in this instance, like for me, there was such a, there was actually over the, a very short period, like two weeks, there was a hugely significant shift. And when we spent that time that Rose was describing, just looking at the material and sort of trying to work out where she 
sat within it and what she was saying. As soon as those anxieties were taken out of the equation, she was actually able to follow through with what she wanted to express. But actually with those things in place, it became impossible for her to complete what she was saying. It was like this massive obstacle that actually stopped her from from owning what she was saying. And she needed to find the liberation and confidence um, and freedom to let go of anxieties around like perfection. And I, and I think it's a really, really common thing, especially in this day and age. And it feels, it feels to me like a really important thing to talk about because I think people need to, they need to understand the dynamics of that stuff so that they can make those shifts in their own lives and in their own creativity and whatever they're undertaking. Mm. It was just incredibly exciting for me to see Rosie find a space for herself where she could actually finish what she was saying. Yeah. It didn't have to hit a wall and then be sort of covered up by the stuff. It was like, actually, no, this is what I'm saying. Mm. This is cheesy and this is positive. Or like, this is, you know, and let's follow that through and let's actually own that. And I think that's, that's something that I really feel very strongly in, in this music that we've made together. Just to finish uh, on some quick fire questions that I want you both to answer as brief as you can. Mm-hmm. Your favourite track on you oh. <laughs> oh that's so mean <laughs> oh, I don't like any of them <laughs> Dave <laughs> hate them all um, I'm gonna go for it changes every day it changes every day but I'm gonna go for Mango okay. because I feel like it's at the heart of the record and it embodies there's something spiritual to it that embodies everything else of the record. When you're writing a record that feels like this is the middle point, for me that that was like the middle point for him. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that. I kind of agree with that. That is what, it came into my head and I'm like, I'm lying on one level. It's not, I basically mm. don't have a favorite, <laughs> but there's, there is just, there's something going on with that tune that is just, yeah. It's like only Rosie could do that track. And I, I love those moments. I love it when it's just like, I feel like that about the whole record, but it's very intense on that tune. It's like, whoa, mm. I don't know anyone else who could make that song or say that stuff in that way, um, be that bold, melodically, uh, express that stuff lyrically. And I just don't know anyone else who can do that. And I just, I love that. That just gives me you know tingles that's kind of where it's at for me I always just want to see people do what only they can do one album from the last 12 months that isn't one that either of you have made that's really you just absolutely love and would like to recommend was Terza was that 12 mm. Terza was last yeah yeah you just nicked mine you guys are you're so on the same wavelength it's boring isn't <laughs> wait a minute it? there might be another <laughs> so we've got Terza from Dave no that was <laughs> Terza from Rosie yeah, that's so unfair <laughs> doesn't no, matter um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> you can both choose the same record. It's fine. Fine. It's, yeah, it's Terza. Terza yeah, gets two votes. That's the most exciting thing that's happened for a long time, in my, in my opinion. Yeah. 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 And what's the best podcast that you've both been on to together? Um, well, we've only ever been on one other, so this so, is the this one. Is yeah. That's exactly the answer that I was leading you into. <laughs> Midnight Chats is a loud and quiet podcast. Music courtesy of Gold Panda. Search Midnight Chats on iTunes for more episodes and to subscribe. For more information, visit loudandquiet.com.